So I want to tell you some applications. I don't have time to prove any of them, but I want to tell you some applications. And I don't have too much time, so uh, let me tell you some applications to a topic that's not even exactly computer science. Uh, I'll tell you applications to an uh, area called social choice, which is like the theory of um, decision making and voting. So, let's say applications. So how do Boolean functions have anything to do with social choice? Uh, Boolean functions uh, can be a model for an election rule. So a function, a Boolean function mapping n plus or minus 1 values to a plus or minus 1 value can be thought of as a voting rule in a n voter two candidate election. Okay, the two candidates are named plus or minus one. And so all the end voters vote for a plus or minus one, and so their votes consist of a Boolean string. And then f tells you, given the votes, who the winner is. So a popular and democratic choice is uh, the majority function. But that's not the only one used in practice. So like to elect a president in America, they use some like electoral college thing which is like a two-level weighted majority of the votes, right? So it's like a two-layer neural network applied to the votes. And in some other countries, they use an election scheme like this, f of x1 through xn equals xi. That's called a dictatorship. Because <laughs> only one person's vote makes a difference. You might think about the voting rule f of x equals negative xi as well. Uh, okay, so that's uh, an interpretation of Boolean functions in terms of voting. And now let me tell you another example of how like Boolean, uh, sorry, Fourier coefficients can tell you things about um, your voting scheme. So there's a concept in analysis of Boolean functions called the influence of the ith coordinate. or voter, if you will, on uh, an election rule f. And in the social choice literature, it's called the Bonzoff power index. It's some attempt to measure how important I's vote is, or useful I's vote is, to an election scheme. Because sometimes like you have different voting powers, right? Like in uh, electoral college with different sized states, like your voting power kind of depends on whether you're in a big state or a small state. So sometimes you have a symmetric scheme like majority, where everybody has the same influence it would seem. Sometimes not. Uh, so the definition of this is it's the um, it's basically the probability that your vote made the difference, or that the ith vote is pivotal. Okay, so the probability that, like, if you compare the outcome when xi votes one way versus when xi votes the other way and everybody else vote remains the same, probability that flips the outcome of the election. And you might say, what's the probability over here? It's over assuming random votes. Uh, wow, plus or minus one. Which might be a little bit weird to think about, assuming that people vote randomly, but, like, in... The social choice literature, this is a known assumption called the impartial culture assumption. It's like some baseline to, I don't know, use when you're trying to, uh, I don't know, understand something about an election rule in otherwise a vacuum. Uh, so yeah, this is a natural concept. It's actually invented in like the 40s, not by Bonzoff, by an earlier person, Penrose. Um, 
And uh, yeah, here's a formula. It's not hard to prove, but you know, I don't have time for it. But in five minutes, we could prove this. The influence of the i voter on an election is the sum over all subsets that uh, contain coordinate i of f hat s squared. Which is very nice, right? In some sense, it's even particularly nice because right, this somehow measures like, oh, just keep me the Fourier coefficients uh, next to monomials that involve the ith voter. And I'll square those and add them up. So this somehow also looks like the importance of i to the Fourier expansion. And it's exactly equal to the influence of voter i on the outcome scheme, on the election scheme. And you can also see this is a number between 0 and 1, right? Because we know that the sum of the squares of all the Fourier coefficients adds up to 1. So that's kind of nice. Um, and in fact, you can prove uh, quite a few very interesting theorems in like mathematical social choice using analysis of Boolean functions. Let me just mention two. So using analysis of Boolean functions, you can prove um, Uh, arrows and possibility theorem. So this is some, um, this is like the most famous theorem, I guess, in uh, social choice. Ken Arrow got like the Nobel Prize in economics for it in the 50s. Basically says if you have any uh, three candidate or three candidate or higher election, um, any, and you're trying to come up with a voting rule for picking a winner out of three candidates that satisfies a bunch of natural properties that you would consider desirable, the only voting rule that has these properties is dictatorship. So it's considered like a negative result for like having up a nice voting rule when there are three or more candidates. And there's very nice proof. Maybe you'll see it on the homework of this theorem using analysis of Boolean functions. And it uses this fact. I'll just write this down without really explaining it. Um, if you have a three candidate election and you let people vote at random and you try to aggregate their votes in a pairwise fashion, then you can get this thing called Condorcet's paradox, which is that the voters uh, uh, seem to prefer candidate A to candidate B, and they prefer B to C, and they prefer C to A, uh, which seems paradoxical, but can happen uh, if you're using like a voting scheme where you like you compare A and B using like a two-candidate rule F. And then you compare B and C using a two-candidate rule F. And you compare A and C using a two-candidate rule F. So you can ask, what's the probability of this paradox occurring if you use a Boolean function F? And again, it's this. It's a Fourier formula. It's 1 quarter plus 3 quarters sum over S negative 1 third to cardinality of S F hat S squared. Okay, let me put it up there because it's kind of cool, right? I mean, this, this interesting thing about voting has this like very kind of elegant like, formula involving the Fourier coefficients. OK, and this is basically what you use to prove Arrow's theorem. Uh, another one that I'll just tell you in words. Uh, I don't have time to write it. It's uh, probably the most famous theorem in purely in analysis of Boolean functions. It's called KKL theorem after Kahn, Kali, and Lineal, who proved it in 1988. And you can state it in terms of voting like this. If you have any two candidate voting rule, like this f, and it also has this property, expectation of f of x equals 0. This is actually an extremely natural property, right? It says that f has 50% plus 1 values and 50% minus 1 values. Okay, So it's not like inherently biased towards one of the candidates. Uh, for any election rule like that, um, you can always find a little of one fraction of the voters like a sublinear fraction of the voters. It's actually like n over log n of the voters, such that if you bribe them, like fix their values to either plus 1 or minus 1, that essentially fixes the outcome of the election in the sense that if everybody else votes randomly, there's a 1 minus little of 1 chance that the outcome of the vote will be equal to the bribed value. So this is also a negative result for voting, but um, it's an interesting result, and like it can only be proven. This one actually using like quite sophisticated um, analysis of Boolean function techniques. In fact, it uses a 
Like the main uh, non-elementary fact in analysis of Boolean functions, which is called hypercontractivity. Just say that long word to scare you. Uh, but the last uh, thing I want to mention is one more application in analysis of Boolean functions that uses this hypercontractivity property. And it's like a generalization of chernoff huffing theorems, which I quite like. So let me mention this last application. So if you remember uh, chernoff huffing theorems, the setup was like, uh, you know, you're adding up a bunch of independent random variables, and you want to say the resulting uh, thing is very close to its mean with high probability. So let me write down something which is essentially how things found. Let capital X1 through capital XN be IID plus or minus one 50-50 random variables. Let P of little x1 through little xn be uh, any linear polynomial, a0 plus a1x1 plus dot 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 plus anxn. The ai's are real numbers. And let y be what you get if you plug in the random plus or minus 1 bits to p. OK, so what's basically going on here is you have these fixed coefficients, and you're adding them up with random plus or minus 1 signs. OK, and Huffingbound tells you the probability that y is far from its mean uh, by like t standard deviations is at most e to the minus t squared over 2. OK, so the just final thing I'll tell you is that using analysis of Boolean functions, you can prove a generalization of this to higher degree polynomials. So just the theorem is that uh, same setup, but if p has degree at most k, uh, same conclusion, but with a worse bound. But still an exponentially strong bound. It's like e to the minus t to the 2 over k. And there's over some constant here. OK, so if k is 1, it matches. And you know, still if k is 2 or 3 or 4, you still get some exponentially fast uh, decay of the probability of being far away from your mean. Yeah? Um, if the order of anything other than a 50 Probability. Does it, is it still that bad? It's a great question. The question is whether what happens if voters in some of these uh, uh, results of voters are voting anything other than 50 50. Um, basically, if the voters' vote probabilities are independent, like they're all voting one way with probability p or even pi for different pi's, you can generally use Fourier analysis to get similar results, but sometimes there's a quantitative dependence on p. If p is going to zero. And actually, a lot of interesting work. Like research work in like you know these current years is like trying to get versions of these theorems that uh, don't have any dependence on p. Yeah. 